Um, good afternoon, everyone. I did not pull the fire alarm, even though I was feeling like I didn't really want to do this today because I got nervous, but it's going to be great. Um, do me a favor and take, put, t put your cell phone in your hand. Take it out if you put it away. I want you to have your cell phone out. Hi, welcome. Um, and you are going to use this at some point in this presentation. I've got like a live survey to fill out. So if you could just have it face down, like somewhere, not not like this while where I'm presenting. But yeah, question. Um, where's the survey? Um, no, you'll see. Um, you'll just if you have internet access, you can participate. So I'll show you where to go. Okay. So if you can just, you're welcome. If you can have your phone out upside down on your desk or on your leg, wherever is fine. Okay. Everybody good? Everybody have a card? Okay, the title of this one is called Good Trouble. Anybody guess where that title comes from? People having trouble with what? No, not that. Any, it's a person. Any guesses? Person. Okay, we'll get to it. So I started working at community colleges about seven years ago, and I noticed a problem. And that problem was that I realized that students the students I was working with, Please. we're videoing. Hi, everyone watching online. Um, the problem that I realized is that students had no idea how much power they actually have. Power to advocate for themselves and power to advocate for others. And I have some ideas of why that is. Like, one of my ideas is that maybe K through 12 doesn't really focus on teaching you to be observing the world around you and being creative about the problems you see. Maybe school is more teaching you to memorize things and test well and obey rather than actually take action. So it started to change my teaching because I wanted my students to actually realize how much power they have power that comes from your real life experiences and things you observe, and power from your creativity and from your voice. So here's what we're gonna do. What this means, empowering students to be advocates in your communities. This is what I'm gonna try and do today, quickly. I'm gonna share some ideas and resources so that you can be people who publicly support or recommend a cause or a policy where you live, learn, or work. So these are the definitions. What does it mean to empower someone? Is to give you ideas and resources. You're the students. What does it mean to advocate? I want you to support or recommend policies or causes. Places that you go to school, places that you live, or places where you work. So I usually give this presentation to teachers. But it's fun because I got to shift it and I get to speak directly to you all today, which is more exciting for me. So where did the title come from? Got a short video for you to watch. It explains the good trouble. We are in a much better place. And I think people said nothing has changed. I just want to say come and walk in my shoes. The signs that I saw when I was growing up, they are gone, and they will not return. The only places that our children and their children will see those signs will be in a book, on a video, or in a museum. I'm going to fast forward due to fire alarm. I'm going to cut a little bit of the video. It, it tells the story of my life. From the time that I was a little boy, growing up in Little Alabama, until the time I walked across the bridge in Selma in 1965, that became known as Bloody Sunday. I hope that people all people, but especially children and young people that pass through this museum will be inspired. 
And my folks have told me over and over again when I would ask them about those signs, white waiting, colored waiting, white only, colored only. They would well, say, so that's the way it is. Don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. But Dr. King and Rosa Parks inspired me to get in trouble, good trouble. And maybe, just maybe this museum would inspire another generation of young people to get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble, to make our country and make our world a better place. So that's where the title of this presentation comes from. Um, Representative John Lewis from Georgia, where I spent most of my life, um, has this idea of get in good trouble. So I want to tell you a story um, because the Civil Rights Movement is where a lot of the title and everything originated. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and about students in the Civil Rights Movement. And then I'm going to bring it to today and actually show you students here and back in Tennessee that were getting in good trouble. Um, to give you some ideas of things people are doing. So this is my neighbor, Reverend Gordon Gibson. He lived like a block from my house in Knoxville, Tennessee, where I was before I came to Wyoming. That's Gordon and his wife, Judy. Look like really lovely people, retired minister. Um, there's this mug shot. And it's a little bit blurry, but it's 2865 Sheriff's Department, Dallas County, Alabama. Um, Reverend Gibson was in seminary at that point. And there he is a couple days after his mug shot. Who's he with? Yeah, Dr. King and some other folks. This photo was taken in February 1965 in Selma, Alabama. The Reverend Ira Blaylock on the left and I on the right had just been released from jail after serving seven days on a five-day sentence, which resulted from taking part in a voting rights demonstration at the courthouse. We were taken downtown to meet the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and speak to reporters. So that's what Gordon told my class in Tennessee when he came to talk to them. So I'll give you another neighbor. This is Mr. Robert Booker. And he lived in a neighborhood kind of across the way, not like the same neighborhood where I walk my dog and stuff, but close enough. Um, and that's Mr. Booker in jail. Um, the caption under that photo says, Knoxville College student Robert J. Booker and Dean John Bell conversed through the city jail peep slot. Mr. Booker was arrested during a protest at the Tennessee Theater on October 9, 1961. So I used to take my students to the Beck Cultural Exchange Center. It was really close to our campus. And it's the Civil Rights Museum in Knoxville, basically. And we would go look at these archives and these photographs. And one day we were there. And the president of the center said, you know, Ms. Dean, do you know that Mr. Robert Booker's here today? He's working in the archives. He said he'd come out and talk to your class if you want to. And I was like, that's so much better than just looking at photographs. He's like in the photographs. So he came out and he told us the story of how he became an advocate in his community. And the deal was that Robert Booker served in the U.S. Army until from 1954 to 1957. One of my students asked him, did you care about any of this stuff when you were a teenager? Like, when did you start to care? And he said, it wasn't until I came back from serving in England and France and all over Europe. He said, I didn't know anything was wrong. I had a good life in Knoxville. But when I went and served in the US Army in England and France, I could go to any play I wanted to. I could eat at any restaurant I wanted to. And guess what? When I came back to Knoxville, Tennessee, me and my Army buddies went to go get steak at the best steakhouse in Knoxville. And they wouldn't let the black soldiers in. And he said, I was so confused. We wore our military uniforms. Like, in France, in England, I could go anywhere I wanted. My hometown won't even let me in the steakhouse. And that was 1958. And he said until that time, he didn't care. He was fine. 
And so then, if you noticed on that picture, do you remember the year he was arrested? 1961. So what started happening about that time is students in colleges started protesting. They started getting into some trouble. And here's the type of trouble they were getting into. These are three college students in Knoxville holding up money. What you can't see is they're outside a ticket booth. They want to buy tickets to see a movie. And they won't let them. There's a ticket booth. This theater is still there. Like we, I used to go in there, see show, all kinds of shows. The caption says, a civil rights protester is carried from the Tennessee theater by Knoxville Police Department Officer James Rowan on May 11th, 1963. At the left is Avon Rollins, who is now the director of the Beck Cultural Exchange Center. You can't see it on this picture at this magnitude, but the film that they're trying to go see is To Kill a Mockingbird. Has anyone read that book? Yeah. It's a lot about race and equity and justice. They are not allowed to go see that film. And so this is 1963. Booker was arrested in 1961 outside the same theater. These are all college students. And they'd go sit in at the lunch counters in town. They'd get kicked out. They'd go sit in outside the theater. They'd get kicked out and arrested. A lot of what happened with the Civil Rights Movement happened because of students. SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, it's referred to as SNCC. Anybody heard of SNCC before? Did you learn about it in history? So SNCC was one of the main sources of the movement. And it was students, college students across the country, trying to get the Voting Rights Act. For the first time, young people decisively entered the ranks of the Civil Rights Movement leadership. They committed themselves to full-time organizing from the bottom up, and with this approach, empowered older efforts at change and facilitated the emergence of powerful new grassroots voices. Before SNCC, with only a few exceptions, notably the Southern Negro Youth Congress, during the 1930s and 40s, civil rights leadership always meant grown-ups. And I think that last statement is really important to pay attention to. Because that myth is still perpetuated in our culture right now. That leadership in the community or anything to do with advocacy, making a difference, grown-ups. Or you gotta have a you gotta have that diploma before anyone will listen to you. And that's not true. It's not true at all. So that's what I want you to see today. So I do want, this is one of those times I want you to use your phone. Um, so whoever's in the room, go to your web browser and type in that. Zeding, I'll spell it for you. And if you're, if you're online, you can participate too. You can still do the poll. www.zeetings.com forward slash wild geese. That's one of my favorite poems by Mary Oliver, Wild Geese. Look it up. Um, Zedings.com, Wild Geese. Can y'all see a poll there? Should look something like this. Yeah. So here's my question. Do you watch or read the news beyond your social media feed? Do you watch or read the news beyond your social media feed? Yes or no? no. Just press the button. How many do you think we have, Stacy, in here? How many people do you think we have in here? 50? Okay. Do you watch or read the news beyond your social media feed? I'll put it back on the website if anybody needs it. All right, 
good. OK, y'all look up here. There will be another one that comes up in a second, OK? So let's see the responses. That's most of the people in the room. Oh, hey, look at that. Y'all don't watch or read the news. Y'all don't pay attention to current events, what's going on. This is what I expected. I'm not surprised because I asked my classes this, and this is what I get. OK? So y'all don't know what's going on. Don't care. I don't know. So what keeps you from being engaged with current events? Are you too, just too busy? What's the main reason you, you don't pay attention? It's all bad and I'm already too stressed? Nothing. I keep up with the news. Or you just don't care? Yeah. Check whichever one. Whichever one fits you, OK? Why don't you keep up with the news? All right, look up here. Y'all look up here for a second. These are all valid reasons. A lot of you work and go to school and take care of either yourself or somebody else, meaning siblings, family. The other thing I find about College Students Day is you're stressed out, legitimately so most of the time. And the news, that, the news makes you more stressed out. And I'm going to tell you right now, sometimes I can't pay attention either because like, I. It, I'm already maxed out on the stress level. A few of you do keep up, and some of you just don't care, right? OK. We'll come back to that in a minute. So there's another author that I really like named Joanna Macy. And this is what she says kind of about the current moment and why people choose not to get into good trouble, choose not to be engaged, choose to kind of check out from what's going on in the world around them. This is what Joanna Macy says. And Joanna Macy, how many of you have heard of Chernobyl? Okay, nuclear disaster. Joanna Macy's life work has been to go into places that have experienced severe disaster like that. The people are hurting, the land's hurting, life is really hard. And she goes back in and tries to help the land and the people heal from that disaster. She does that kind of work with people. So this is what she says. It's a dark time filled with suffering and uncertainty. Like living cells in a larger body, it's natural we feel the trauma of our world. But don't be afraid of the anguish you feel or the anger or fear, because these responses arise from the depth of your caring and the truth of your interconnectedness with all beings. And so this is what I want to challenge you today. We talk about that, this in my classes a lot, that like, you might be fine, but if other people around you in your community are hurting, you're actually not fine. So you might be fine in school. You might have plenty to eat. You might have a safe and happy home that you go home to. You might have good, solid transportation to get here. But everybody suffers when anybody suffers. So if you've got classmates that don't have enough food, don't have good shelter, safe place to stay, a way to get to campus, our whole school community hurts, even if you won't acknowledge it. So you have a choice of whether or not you want to lean into that a little bit and say, OK, maybe I could become more aware. Or if it's you that's experiencing those things, you're an expert in the pain that's being felt in the community. You can also advocate for yourself and others and find that power to make positive change. Okay? So here's what she suggests you go through. Number one, open yourself up to being grateful for something. Number two, own the pain for the world around you or in your own life. Three, start to see with new eyes. Start observing and paying attention Four, go out. So I kind of adjusted her, 
her ideas for college students. And this is what I this is how I suggest you approach this. Number one, you need gratitude to ground yourself. Own the pain in your community. That means you gotta pay a little bit more attention. You gotta listen to people. If you notice somebody doesn't seem like they're doing well, take a little bit more ownership of that. If you aren't doing well, own it, okay? And then you gotta imagine, and this is what I think has been taught out of you by the time you get to college. Imagining what it could look like if everybody was taken care of. Instead of just accepting it for being a broken mess or, oh, there's always gonna be people hurting, like, actually imagine what it could look like for all of your peers to have enough food to eat, for everybody to be able to get to school when they needed to, for everybody to get, be able to go to the doctor when they needed to. What could that even look like? Why do we just say, like, it's fine, it's always going to be this way? And then you act. So this is why I suggest gratitude or being grateful for something. In my English class, the first thing a student's write an essay about is something you're grateful for, like a memory or a person that you're grateful for. And here's why. If you're going to be an advocate in your community for yourself or for others, it kind of goes against these values we have in America that are not bad values, but they get in the way sometimes of helping ourselves or helping others, right? Bootstrapping, individualism, independence. I just am going to take care of myself. I don't need anybody else. You should just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. That's what you need to do. Sometimes you need help. And the thing is, every single one of us that's here today has been helped by someone, seen or unseen. Every single one of you have been helped. I have too. We all actually do need help, whether it's this moment or in the future. We all will need it. And anyone can help. So if you ground yourself in gratitude, you get to this place where you can actually realize like, I've been helped before. Maybe I can go out and help somebody else. Maybe it shouldn't always be up to people to just figure it out themselves. Okay? So, well, now we're going to go back to the survey. And I'm curious, what pain do you see students at Western experience? Y'all know, I mean, I'm a teacher, I see and hear stuff but y'all see in here more than I do. Do you know students that have hunger or food insecurity? Do you know students that don't have a safe and steady place to stay? Do you know students that can't go to the doctor, can't afford it? Do you know students that need mental health care and can't get there or can't afford it? These are all anonymous, by the way. What do you see or hear about? What do you think's going on here? If you haven't heard any of these, you don't have to check anything. here. So this is according to you all, the students, and a couple of faculty or staff are here too. Thank you. That's the order. This is what y'all are seeing or hearing or observing. I agree with you. I think this is very true here. <laughs> and we have research studies that show that 40% of community college students experience food insecurity. And food insecurity means they don't, it ranges from like not having enough to eat consistency, consistently to like actually giving up meals so other people in your family can eat, to running out of money at the end of the month, that kind of thing. It's a wide range. Eating ramen, if y'all have heard me say this, eating ramen three meals a day, because that's all you can afford is not food security. 
It's not wrong to love ramen. But if that's all you can eat, you're not going to you're not going to do well in school, okay? So look, this is what we see around All right, now zoom out a little bit. I want you to think about the state, wherever you're from. If you're not from Wyoming, think about home. So let's get out of the western walls for a second. What do people in your state experience? What's going on here? Are people experiencing environmental problems like public land access, clean air, clean water? Are they experiencing economic problems? Poverty, can't get a good job, can't afford basic human needs. Health problems, lack of health care for physical or mental well-being. Dental care. What about civil rights issues? Are people being harassed and discriminated against based on any of those protected classes? What's going on in your state? So outside the college walls. So it updates based on the num current number of votes for, and like orders for them. So where y'all are at right now in your expert observations of being a person who lives in the world, you see people struggling with health, economic issues, environmental issues, so mostly health issues, okay? All right. You can flip your phones over. That's all the surveys for right now. Thank you for participating. All right. So in my classes, we study like these sort of issues that people experience in the world, social problems. like. Problems people encounter when they're just trying to be human in the world. We all need food, shelter, water to survive, right? We also need safety. So we study problems people have existing in our communities. And a community can be the school, the city, the state, OK? So inevitably, almost every semester, a student comes to me and says, Ms. Dean, this is too depressing. Are we ever going to do anything? Are we going to stop studying the problem? And that's where the good trouble comes in. You all have just shown me that you see problems, you hear about them, so what can you do? So I'm going to now show you some stuff some students have done. This is in 2016, Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Anybody been to Gatlinburg, Smoky Mountain? One. Yay. OK. Two. Um, not as many tourists as Yellowstone and the Tetons. I was not prepared for Yellowstone and the Tetons because I was used to the Smokies. Totally different places. Um, but Gatlinburg, a, a fire was started by two high school students, um, and it burned um, a lot of the area, and it burned a lot of homes, and it came into town. It was a lot of people lost their homes. And um, it was the end of the year. It was like November, December. So it was getting on winter, too. So this is one of my students. Um, and this is a profile that one of the volunteer organizations wrote about her. This is Melina. She's been going to school full time, working, and then spending her nights at the rescue squad. When she isn't working or taking finals, she's been translating. She's fluent in Spanish. Um, and going around picking up donations from people that can't get to drop it off or live in Knoxville and can't make it out there. She's also been all over Facebook asking for volunteers, keeping everyone up to date on where volunteers are needed. She's been so selfless in all of this and only wants to give back. So Melina was in my class the year before this, but um, there's an example of a student. Nobody told her what to do. She just did it. She saw people hurting. She saw people in the community suffering. And she was like, what do I have? I can speak Spanish and I can get donations, and I've got a car. And she we went back and forth, and she really worked hard for several weeks and really filled a need in the community, especially to make sure 
Spanish-speaking people knew what resources they could access. Okay? It's a college student. So was she the one that started the fire? Oh, no, no. A high school student started the fire. Yeah, no. No, she, no, she was at home studying probably. Okay, here's another example. The college I was at was called Pellissippi State. So this student, um, not one of my students in a different English class, did a research project on studying homelessness in college students. And she realized that it wasn't just this abstract thing way out in the world that some college students are homeless, but like there were actually students at our campus like living in their cars. We didn't have residential housing at all. Not that that would make any difference, but we had students who did not have a safe place to stay. So she wrote to the foundation of the school and said, we need to establish a homeless student scholarship that can only be given to students experiencing homelessness. And she fundraised for it. She went out to the news station and said, I'm doing, like, we're doing fundraising for this scholarship. And so now, it's been years now. When was this? 2014? It's been five years. That scholarship is now there, and I think they fund up to five students to go. And I have had students living in the shelter downtown in my classes at that school because a student did the research and went to the foundation and said, hey, we need to take care of other students. Okay? University of Kentucky students are killing it. Um, I've been following them for a while. Uh, about three years ago, they went to their cafeteria and said, we don't want you to throw away any more good food at the end of the day because there's so much waste. If you think that's too much, think about water pollution. Yes, we will get to environmental stuff. So one of the things that those students did is they, the students at University of Kentucky started this really cool program where students go and get the food that's fine at the end of the day, but they're not going to serve it tomorrow, and they package it up. And get this, the way the program works, students go deliver it. A student who needs to eat, right, they take turns. Like they cook one night a week for each other. So you cook one night a week, you get to eat for six, okay? Also, these students deliver the meals to seniors in the community that don't have enough food or can't cook for themselves anymore. So a student takes meal out to their senior buddy and they have dinner together or they just drop it off, whatever they both want, and the food waste in the cafeteria doesn't exist anymore. Students started that. Well, that was years ago. Well, now what they did is the meal plans there had gotten so expensive and all the little dining options, like UK is a big school, so it's a little bit different than here, but students couldn't afford to eat on campus. And they, the students did a study, a research study, and figured out just how many students couldn't afford to eat on campus. And they went to the administration and said, your students can't eat. Like, this affects all of us. This affects people in the classroom. This affects grades. This affects everything. And nothing happened. And so the students took a, you know, extreme measure, and I'm not telling you to go do a hunger strike, but they did, and they sat outside. This was early this spring. You can look up the articles. And they said, we're not eating until everybody can afford to eat on this campus. And the administration listened, and now they have a special $1 meal every day. So basically, they make enough money off the other stuff that they could afford to offer like a $1 meal special every day for students who couldn't afford the others. Students did that. College students did that. So when I say imagine, like, imagine these things, what I really want you to do also is like the to imagine and include. So what is inclusion? What did I mean by that? How many of y'all have heard the words inclusion? Sometimes it's with diversity and inclusion. Inclusion imagines a way of us being human in the world together. It's not us all individually doing our own thing. Like, how can we all exist as humans and thrive as humans in the world together? Not just independently, but also interdependently. How can we take care of each other? How can I take care of myself and take care of other people?
So here's the thing with um, essays. I have a pet peeve about English essays that are like, are you for or against this thing? Are you for or against this thing? When most of life is really in the gray. So no more binaries. You have or have not. It is this or isn't this. Like, imagine what it could be a lot of things. Imagine the possibilities of including everyone. Inclusion is connection. And we know with college students that connectedness and a sense of belonging correlate with higher retention rates. You're more likely to stay in school if you feel included and cared for <coughs> by your peers, by your institution. And, in, and you replace otherness with sameness. You no longer say, oh, that's them, they're this, and I'm this. We're all the same. We all meet on this basic human level. When you start to see people as more like you than not alike, you start to be more willing to help others. So one of the things I suggest you do if you see a problem is you start to narrow it down. Because the problems are, usually students try to solve world issues. And like, you can't. I'm sorry. It's way too messed up. But what you can do is solve a very, 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 very localized issue. So you want to think about who the population that you care about or is having this problem. Is it youth? Is it people in foster care? Elders, seniors? People who are differently abled? Veterans? College students? What resources currently exist? Do some research. This is what people, students are always like, English class, ugh, what, what do I use any of this for? Use your research skills to find out what exists in the community. Like we have a food bank here. But what population do they serve? Is it confidential? What's the capacity? Like, are there college students that can't get to the food bank? Maybe it's not a food bank issue, but a transportation issue. So you start to look up your research, find your resources that already exist, so you don't create a whole new thing that's already being done. And then you also have to figure out who's in charge. So at an institution, that could be employees or the board, like at the school. Local, is it school board, is it city council, is it county commission? State, agencies, representatives, figure out who actually has the power. Who has the money is another way of thinking about it. Who has the power and the money to do something? Um, this is one of my other former students, Dennis. He's going to talk to you for a second about the volunteer work he did. Is You're on. Right now? Yeah. Oh, it's on. Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> yep. Well, I think that service learning was a really great project to be involved in. I mean, I was myself a homeless veteran for some period of time, and I got to go out into the city of Knoxville and participate in feeding over 150 people at one time. And the discouraging thing is that a vast percentage of those people are veterans, and I find it appalling that there are the ones that end up in need of those services. Yeah. You know, what can you do? It's part of life. But it, it was um, really impressive how well that the, uh, the Knoxville Dream Center put this pro uh, together, and they do it every single Wednesday night, and they feed a couple hundred people. You know, so they've got it pretty well streamlined. But like for a student to go there and see that, number one, it's impressive. But two, I, I learned a lot from it and uh, was very helpful for my uh, English class in that I... I Sorry, I got to cut a little bit short, but um, at the end of the video, I ask him, what do you want to do with this? And he says, well, my current plan is to graduate from the community college and go get my degree in social work. And that was like four years ago, and he did graduate. But since he went to the University of Tennessee, he changed majors to journalism. Because he realized, you know, here is a formerly homeless veteran who has gotten to the point where he can go out and try to help and heal other homeless veterans. And he realized what his strength was, was actually telling stories of veterans, writing about the issues going on with the food bank, with the different groups that were feeding the community. Instead of doing counseling for the veterans, he, would, he more enjoyed actually just going and talking to them and helping to tell their stories from the perspective of someone who had experienced it, okay? College student. I know you're thinking he's a little bit older, but 
Here's my last thing. My students write letters to commissioners and things like that. And this is what one of the commissioners wrote back. Please advise your students to check the spelling of names and the government entity. We are Knox County Commission, not Knoxville Commission. Mayor Rojero is spelled as Rojero, not Robero. This is the third letter from students with mistakes. Womp womp. People will find any reason possible not to listen to you or value your voice. Don't give them any reason, okay? So here's my advice with your intention. That was my face when I got that email. Aww. Know your audience. Don't write the state senator about legalizing chickens in Rock Springs. I do think someone should try to legalize chickens in Rock Springs, but don't write the state senator because they aren't going to do that, okay? Right now, nobody can have chickens in the city of Rock Springs, just so you know. Um, proofread your emails. Earn, earn their attention. And then go back and address their resistance, OK? Folks are going to find any reason possible not to listen to you. Don't give it to them. Be intentional. And I'll leave you with just a quick word from anybody know who this is? Yeah, graduated last year. Um, she went down to the, she went down and advocated for the recycling center to be open up. So here's her advice to you. Oh. What do you think students need to keep in mind if they start speaking up or advocating for things in the local community? So there's a few things to keep in mind. I think the biggest thing is, uh, well, one of the biggest things is not to get discouraged as you're going. Uh, things happen in small increments. Uh, there's little setbacks that can or can't be out of your control. Uh, you have to remember that at the end of the day, you know, you're juggling a lot of different things. Your advocacy work is only one thing. Uh, you have to keep everything else in balance to make it successful too. Uh, your advocacy work won't succeed if you're if you're all over the place. You have to kind of focus and delegate time for each thing. So we're out of time. Um, this video, the whole presentation will be online, so I encourage you to go watch everything she has to say to you. And the bottom line is I would like for students to know how much power you have. Find a way to get in the way and get in good trouble and make our country, also our school, also this town, a better place. Okay? Thank you all. Thank you.